lecture here is about bias and power of uh, bias. Basic. S. Settings, okay? So it's the settings of your computer. When you switch on the computer, you normally hit the F2 key, isn't it? And these settings load up, okay? What kind of things do you see in the settings? Boot order, okay. What order you boot up? That's one thing. Anything else? Date and time. Date and time, yeah. Security options. Uh, security options, yeah. So, do, where do you want to pass or protect the bias so nobody else can hack into the bias? Very good. Is that, that chipset important? Uh, they, they probably do some of the processor specs, uh, some of the specs for the RAM. Uh, if you've got um, anything connected to an ID or a SATA cable, be it a hard drive, you know, those kind of settings there. Uh, will show up in your bias. <coughs> Where are those settings stored? In the bias chip. chip, also known as the CMOS. CMOS, yeah, also known as the CMOS chip. And they maintain themselves when the computer is powered up. They they're stored because the battery is still alive, and uh, the battery is keeping that memory alive to make sure that uh, they're they're stored, so you don't lose your settings. If we want to reset. Or by your settings, if you've made a mess of your settings, you want to reset them. The jumpers. Yeah, on the motherboard, there's a, a little bit of plastic jumper which you could take off a couple of pins. If you take it off and restart, it should reset your bias settings so you, uh, you shouldn't have any bother. And then when you replace the jumpers, the settings will be held from that point forward again. Okay, so that's uh, a little bit about it before I talk about it. Okay, so the bias driver, one of the most basic, uh, most common uses of, of flash memory is the basic input-output system on your computer, commonly known as the bias. On virtually every computer available, the bias makes sure all other chips, hard drives, ports, and CPU function together, which is also known as the, the post test, the power on self test, okay? So after uh, the bias settings have been established, the computer goes on to to run the, the power on self test, which we'll talk about uh, in a little bit more detail in a minute. BIOS software is stored on a non volatile. Doesn't forget it when you turn it off. Very good, yeah. It's, it keeps storing it when, you're, uh, when you have it turned off. Uh, ROM chip, which means read only memory chip, on the motherboard. Okay. So that's how the BIOS driver operates and what BIOS is. There's a typical BIOS screen there uh, on front of you. That, uh, that's the main settings page for that. And you can see there's things like, can I zoom into that? No. Let's get back there now. Uh, standard CMOS uh, settings, peripheral settings, power management settings, uh, supervisor settings. What you say? Uh, the zoom button there, yeah. I'll, I'll leave that, it'll complicate things. Thanks for the suggestion. <laughs> okay, so the BIOS provides a small library of basic input and output functions used to operate and control the peripherals such as keyboards, text, display functions, and so forth. These software library functions are, are also callable by external software. So you need, when you boot up your computer before you get onto the operating system, you need to be able to interact Okay, for example, one of the interactions is, how do we call up the BIOS settings itself? You have to be able to press the keyboard, don't you? So straight away, you need to load these drivers so that the keyboard can talk to the computer so that we can interact, boot into safe mode, for example, uh, uh, tweak the BIOS settings with our keyboard, uh, and uh, also so that you can be able to output to the screen as well. Operating systems, once the, the BIOS is finished and the, the, the post test is finished, you then hand over to the operating system, which, repl uh, which provides replacement software interfaces to applications. Okay? ANSI.sys. Okay? That may come up in a question. So the ANSI.sys driver defines functions that change display graphics control cursor movements, and reassign keys. The ANSI.sys driver supports the ANSI terminal emulation of escape sequences, controller system, screen, and keyboard. A fancy way of saying, like I said there, you need to be able to control input and output before you get to the operating system. So this is what's loading. The ANSI.sys driver is what's loaded in the, 
the background there to, to so you can see on the screen so you can input and control on the screen before you get to the operating system uh, loading up power on self test the post test uh, the test the computer to make sure it meets the necessary system requirements and that all the hardware is working properly before starting the remainder of the boot uh, process and uh, what I've likened to before is um, where you're doing an engine check I suppose in uh, if you're uh, driving a plane or something you check your engines you check that all the systems are functioning so if a computer passes the, uh, the post the, the computer now this may not be the case in more modern computers okay uh, the computer will have a single beep with some computer bias manufacturers it may be twice as the computer starts and the computer will continue to start up normally however if the computer fails the computer will either not beep at all or will generate a beep code which tells the users the source of the problem and in hardware essentials we've gone through some uh, beep codes there so that's to let you know there's a spot of bother on your power on self tests okay so you should really know for the exam what uh, power on self test is about kind of things it tests checks keyboard monitor, keyboard monitor <laughs> mouse <laughs> internal components yeah, yeah. E example RAM, yeah okay was the ram cleared you know the ram is meant to be cleared isn't it uh, it's meant to be temporary memory was it flushed out properly the last time the computer switched off okay if you switch off like too quickly the RAM it may not be properly cleared if uh, improper shutdown there okay uh, what's going on here hmm. okay so troubleshooting for post, if you have a bother with post and you've, uh, you come across beep codes when you're booting up, one of the reasons why you might get a beep code when you're, uh, when you're booting up into post could be, have I, done, have I changed the system? Okay, Have I opened the system and installed an extra uh, module of RAM, for example? Have I changed the CPU? Have I changed something about the configuration? If I get a beep code, and I've made a change in configuration. It seems obvious enough that you should undo that change, go back to the way it was, and see does that cure the beep code? Because that may be so, uh, something you do may be causing the beep code. Remove any disk drives, in, uh, including USBs. So if there's any drives attached externally, take them out of the equation. So when you're diagnosing problems with both, uh, a post, it's uh, a method. Cancellation would be the method. You're cancel. You're trying to cancel out what the problem could be. Disconnect any peripheral devices, um, uh, mouse and keyboard and so on. Check the check the fans, check cables, check the RAM, check the uh, reset the CPU, CPU. So you may be asked in the exam some some uh, troubleshooting measures that you would take if you got a uh, a post beep code. Very obvious thing to do. Listen to the amount of beeps. Read them. Read the manual created by the manufacturer of the of the, the post. Okay, what what does the beep code mean? That might that might tell you whether it's a peripheral device or RAM. It might point you in the right direction towards the solution to your problem. Okay, so here is an example. Then, if you do read the ma manual, uh, for example, no beeps could mean you have no power. One short beep could be uh, in this particular type of post means you're okay. Two short beeps, it says look at the screen. So not only read the manual, read the screen is, is a good tip. There could be a message there telling you a code that uh, tells you what's wrong. Um, again, one long and two short beeps, you've got an issue with the motherboard. And there's a, a various, list, uh, various list of ones that follow there. So uh, as well as trying out the other things that are there, maybe the first protocol is listen to the beeps, look at the screen for the error codes uh, to help you as well, okay? Okay, power supply troubleshooting. Okay, something we've we've looked at again in hardware essentials. So I feel this is a, a recap really. Make sure that the wall socket have has power. So if the computer isn't po powering on or, or there's some some element of power uh, with a spot of bother, make sure that it's plugged in at the wall. So check check using a lamp or some other item you can plug in. Check the 
check the, the power socket in the wall with that and you might have a cho phone charger handy or something like that if there's no power please ensure uh, to fix the problem check if the cable uh, is not damaged so the power cables itself uh, and plugged in properly so you're starting if you've got a power supply issue from the power in the wall to the computer if the power in the wall is working you start moving uh, to the cable itself eliminate that the cable is the issue uh, then if there's no problem with the cable you're going inside the case then that's the path you take when you're diagnosing uh, power supply issues uh, check if the power supply has a power switch so some computers have an extra power switch in the back we may, we may have seen that in the computers that we're using here in the lab uh, there, there may be a flick switch at the back as well as the the push button that's on the, the front of your computer and make sure you've turned on every power switch and the power button is on in your computer that's uh, power supply troubleshooting. Okay, the power up of the computer itself in the book, How Computers Work, the ninth edition, I think you've all got a copy of that. <coughs> yeah, this is where this extra, this set of steps here really is, is taken as a summary. There's a couple of good pages there on the whole sequence of, of a computer uh, booting up. So I'll just talk my way through the this. This is something I can nearly guarantee this comes up as a, a question. So you should have maybe a good technique to visualize yourself what happens when a computer switch on. Can you visualize the whole process? Okay, so step one. Once the power switch uh, is pressed, the current moves to the CPU where the electrical uh, signal clears leftover data from the chip's internal me memory registers. So you're, what you're doing to start is you're clearing out the old stuff so you can start with a fresh new boot up okay the signal also places a specific uh, specific hexadecimal code what is a hexadecimal code um, or what will that hexadecimal code do hexadecimal code yeah, it's, a, it's an instruction, isn't it? So the instruction there is going into the, the register, okay, called the program counter, to get your computer up and running, okay? Okay, step two. So all that's going on there in step one is that the CPU is clearing out the old stuff and it's setting se itself up for a new boot up by putting this code into the register called the program counter. Okay, CPU gets itself ready, that's step one. Once the current goes into the CPU, it gets itself ready. And uh, there's fancy bits in there to explain how that gets ready, okay? So that's what you're trying to visualize in your head. As soon as the computer boots up, the CPU is where it starts. Now it's time for the bias to take over, okay? So it starts, the bias starts to wake the computer components, giving them the power on self-test. So now you're checking all the other components to make sure the necessary parts of the computer are present and functioning properly. Okay, the bias loads into memory the device drivers, okay, and interrupt handlers. Interrupt handlers? Who's, who's going to interrupt? Huh? Yeah, it could be Ray. Who else could interrupt? What interrupts? The computer's booting away by itself, okay? Give me an example of an interruption to the boot process. Uh, you plug something in. You plug something in, plug something out. What, what else could be an interruption? CD drive. You might, yeah, open up CD drive. Any other interruption? If I hit the F2 key, is that an interruption? Yeah. Yeah. So I know it doesn't, I know something like you're talking about sounds more like an interruption where you plug something out and all that, like that you're really interrupting it. But you're interrupting the, the computer getting from booting up from. Uh, from zero to, to operating system. If you're if you're hitting F2, that means you're saying, stop, hold on, I'm interrupting you here. I want to change some settings before you move on. Or I want to boot up in a different way to normal. Or I want to change a boot sequence so I'm going to the CD rather than the hard drive. So as far as boot sequence is concerned, that's interrupt handlers allow you to be able to, to process that. What, uh, what should you have as the first boot up? Should it be like the What's the uh, I'm not sure. Uh, are you talking about boot order? Is yeah, it? It, that, that would just depend on your situation. If uh, On the network here, it's probably best that we boot to hard drive first because if somebody puts in a CD and leaves it in there and you have CD first, 
uh, somebody could switch on a computer and try and boot into that CD and get confused. Or, or even the, you know, the USB sticks? Yeah, the computers nowadays can boot up off USB sticks. So what if a student leaves a USB stick in the computer and you're trying to boot up and it's set to boot to USB? The computer's not, it's going to get interrupted. The, the presence of the USB sticks will interrupt the, the, boot, the boot up, okay? So it would be best in this environment to, to be booting up from the hard, the hard drive. Uh, typically, that's the way people go boot up off hard drive first, unless you want to install change, you know, uh, installation, unless you want to install a CD or something. So that's what, what I, that would be my general recommendation to go with that. Uh, so the BIOS loads into memory the device drivers and interrupt handlers from the basic hardware in the system, such as keyboard, mouse, hard drive, and floppy drive. Whenever you press a key, the keyboard generates a code specific to that key, and the device driver translates the code uh, as needed for the CPU to understand it. The interrupt handlers are responsible for bringing the CPU's attention to the code waiting for the microprocessor. Very fancy way of saying, if you press a key, something different happens. Okay, next step. To be sure that all the PC's operations function in a synchronized, orderly fashion, the CPU also checks the timer. Okay, so just to recap on what we've done so far, the CPU clears itself out, gets started, the BIOS takes over, checks all the components are okay, thumbs up. Uh, then the, uh, the interaction between keyboard, mouse, and monitor, so you can interrupt things uh, um, during the boot up, happens. Now we're going to check the clock so that everything is synchronized, okay? Because the motherboard will operate on what's called a synchronous transition, which means every tick of the system clock of that processor, and we know the processor is timed in gigahertz, isn't it? Every time that that clock ticks, uh, you're sending signals between components, just as CPU and RAM, and that's got to be synchronized so that uh, you don't jumble up the data. Uh, the CPU also checks the system timer on the real-time clock, which is responsible for pacing signals. Okay, so when you think of clock there, don't think of the system date and time. Think of the amount of gigahertz. You know, you're think talking about billions of instructions being sent for, uh, per second. Okay, so the system clock uh, times how many instructions can be uh, sent per, section, uh, per second. Number six, the post tests the memory contained on the display adapter. Okay, so you, if you do have... Uh, a memory card, uh, or there's there's onboard memory dedicated to, to your graphics, uh, the post will test that, and the video signals the control the display. Number seven, the BIOS runs a series of tests to ensure that the RAM chips are functioning properly. Eight, the post sends a signal over specific paths on the bus to internal floppy optical and hard, hard drives and listens for a response. Okay, so you're checking what cables are you checking here? Or what ports on your motherboard are you checking here? Yeah, if there's, there could be three or four SATA ports, three or four ID ports. So all that's happening here is that the post goes out to those and says, is there anything connected there? And if it is connected, is it reading okay? Or is, it, is the basic function of that okay? That's, that's what it's saying there. And if it's not okay, probably sends a beep code and inter, uh, interrupts you and ask you to fix uh, the beep code, okay? Um, so listens for a response to determine which drives are available. Number 10 then, that ends post, and the BIOS transfers control of the PC to the operating system on the hard disk, and you can boot up. So very, very lightly, I can nearly promise you this, that you will be asked the question, explain how a computer powers up from when you touch the power button until the BIOS hands over control to the operating system. And you know, you see that screen, Windows is starting, okay? So that's what's described here in that paragraph from the, the power switch to that screen which says Windows is starting or, uh, or you see the Apple signal if you're on an Apple computer or if you're on Linux or Ubuntu, you see the appropriate logos there that their operating system is loading up. Okay. Last one there has a few questions. That's pretty much it for 